morning church you guys doing well I love being at the lake if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you my name is Tom and I've had the privilege and the honor of doing ministry with Pastor Ronnie for many years now and I knew he was going on vacation with his bride Karen and every time he's going on vacation I'm like pick me pick me please pick me and he asked if I'd be willing to come and talk because Karen has a very, very important rule, and that is, Ronnie, you are not allowed to do message prep while we're on vacation. I think that is a fantastic rule. That is a time for them to just relax, enjoy each other, and just get rejuvenated. And so I think right now they're both refreshed and tired of all that weird mixture that we all know so well when we come back from vacation. But I'm so excited to be here. I even have a little friend on stage with me. Ronnie said, you're more than welcome to take my little friend, uh, this pig that has wings, when pigs fly. And I said, why in the world would I not want a little friend on stage to accompany me? So I have no idea what his name is, but that is actually a little weird. I feel like he's staring at me. That's even weirder. You might have to come get that thing. Oh, that's the first time I think I've heard that song too. What a great song. I love the line, the Lord is here. Do you believe he's here with us this morning? Yeah. Absolutely. And all I want is all that you are. Will you meet me here again? What an amazing thing to pray every single day. What an amazing thing to pray right now that God will meet us here today. I believe that God will do big things here today. I believe that God will continue to do big things through this church, his bride, the church, Lake Community Church. I can tell you that this place doesn't exist just simply to come and meet on the weekends, but it is to go out into this community, to go out into the workplace and be the hands and the feet of Jesus. And I hope y'all know how blessed you are to sit under the amazing teaching and the leadership of Pastor Ronnie. He truly is an amazing man of God. He's one of the best teachers I know. Pastor Brian, yes, I think that's worth a round of applause for him. <laughs> Pastor Brian, leading you guys every single week. How about Pastor Eric? And uh, he just got ordained uh, just shortly ago. Super, super proud of that. I can tell you, after going through that, that is not an easy task. And so... Uh, I'm sure he could feel y'all's prayers as he was going through that process. But when Ronnie asked if I would speak in this series, When Pigs Fly, and told me what it's about, it's about the miracles of God. And are you paying attention to the miracles of God all around us? I said, absolutely. I would love to speak because I believe miracles of God happen all the time. They happen this morning with us waking up. I said, what exactly is it that week that you want me to teach on? He said, the miracle of provision. I said, absolutely. But then I thought, what in the world am I going to talk about? Because when it comes to the miracle of provision, I'm pretty sure I could just stand up here for about 35 or 40 minutes and do nothing but testify about the miracle of provision in my life and my family's life from God. But I don't want to do that. I, I know that y'all didn't come here to hear me testify for 35 minutes. I do want to go to God's word. And so I was thinking, what in the world could I, could I talk about? But I was researching and reading different things online, I came across this amazing story online about God's provision. It says, shortly after World War II, a woman went into the grocery store and asked for enough food to provide Christmas dinner for her children. When the owner asked how much she could afford, she replied, my husband was killed in the war. Truthfully, I have nothing to offer but a little prayer. The grocer, who was not a believer, 
was unmoved by her need. And so he sarcastically said, write your prayer on a piece of paper and you can have its weight and groceries. To his surprise, she pulled a folded note out of her pocket and handed it to him. I already did that during the night while, my, while I was watching over my sick child, she replied. Without even reading it, he put it on one side of his old-fashioned scale. Well, we'll see how much that's worth, he muttered. He put a loaf of bread on the other side of the scale, and to his surprise, nothing happened. He added some more items, but to his consternation, still nothing happened. Finally, he blurted out, well, that's all this will hold anyway. Here's a bag. You can put the things in it yourself. And with a tearful thank you, the woman took her groceries and left. The grocer later discovered that the scale was out of order. As the years passed, he often wondered if it was just a coincidence. Why did the woman have the prayer already written before he asked for it? Why did she come at exactly the time that the mechanism was broken? Whenever he looks at the slip of paper that contains her prayer, he is amazed for it reads, Please, dear Lord, give us this day our daily bread. How great is that? And maybe you hear me say that and you're like, well, that's a cool story, Tom. And you can find stories like that all over the internet. But how do you even know if that story is true? The answer to that is, I have no idea if that story is true. But I can tell you a true story. And it's a story of how God got to me. I was raised in the church. I've, I was blessed to be raised by an amazing family. My parents will be here at the next service. They are my biggest supporters, biggest cheerleaders of following the call of God in my life. I, so I was blessed I was raised in church. Went through youth group, did everything. But early on in my marriage, I, I was just like a lot of early 20-something-year-olds. I mean, I'd go to church, and when I did go to church, I'd check a box. I did my good deed. If I felt like it, I was bored, there was nothing good on TV, I'd pick up the Bible and I'd read a little something, something. But I was not what I would call a, a faithful Christ follower. And so I am extremely blessed. I would say the only biggest, bigger cheerleader in my life, other than my parents, would be my bride, Leah. And we've been married 20 years this coming June. She looks like she's about 23. So I got her when she was real young, before she knew any better. But so we were early on in our marriage, and like probably most of you, unless you were given something, we didn't have a pot to pee in. I mean, we had no money. There was always more month left at the end of the money. Anybody know what that feels like? Yeah, probably most of us. And so we had no money. We would go to church, and she said, Tommy, the more I read about the Bible, it keeps talking about giving, and, and we should tithe. And by the way, this is not going to be a money talk, I promise. I'm just telling you how God got to me, and he got to me through money. And so she said, I think we should tithe. And I said, I think that's a horrible idea. And I was the guy who came up with every single excuse. I said, babe, we'll just give of our time. We'll tithe of our time, which... Think about that. What is that? 2.4 hours a day or something? That wouldn't have happened, I can assure you. But uh, we'll just volunteer at the church. We'll do this. But I think giving money when we already don't have money is a horrible idea. And besides that, I'm pretty sure God doesn't need our money and, and he'll be fine without it. And I, I tell this story and say Leah is the most biblical wife and she is a submissive wife in a biblical way when she knows that I am in step with what God is saying in my life. But this one time, I am so grateful that she listened to God and not me. And she said, I, I, I'm doing it anyway. And so I don't remember how often I got paid, but if it was a pay week and that basket came by, we gave. But I can tell you, I was not a cheerful giver. It was more like, I was just mad. Seriously. And so about that time, we had the first thing in our life, major thing, break. I don't remember what it was, maybe a water heater or something like that. All I remember is it was $1,387.96, which to somebody who had no money might as well have been $100,000. It didn't matter. There was no way for us to come up with that money. And I'm like, you know what, babe? I bet you if we hadn't been tithing, we'd have that money. She was like, no, we wouldn't. And you know it. And I was like, all right, you're right. We would have spent it too. Well, it was tax time. And so we didn't have an accountant. We'd go to a little tax person and we're sitting there and I was so mad and I probably had steam coming out my ears and 
he's probably hurrying up, freaking out like there's a crazy man sitting across from me. And he was right. I was mad. And he's typing in our information. He goes, oh, man, y'all got a tax return. I'm like, whatever, that's fine. He was like, okay, are you interested in your tax return? I'm like, yeah, yeah, show me. And he took the computer screen and he turned it around. And our tax return that year was $1,387.96. And in that tax office, I sat there and I wept like a baby. And it was in that moment that God finally got my attention. And I said, I get it. Your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. They're much higher. But God, if I can trust you with my eternity, I think I can trust you with the $1,387.96 moments of my life. And it was in that moment that he got me. And I think he got me through money. He gets us however he wants to get us. But I believe he got me that way because he knew the crazy journey that our life would be on over the next 20 some odd years. Really, really good times. Really, really low times. And regardless of where we find ourselves, he would always point me back to that moment and just say, trust me. I am the God of provision. And so when, when Pastor Ronnie asked if I talk about provision, I said, absolutely, I would love to talk about that. And so one of the verses I want to just kind of make a theme verse for today is Philippians 4.19. And I want you to kind of just filter this message through this verse. Philippians 4.19 says, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. The same God who takes care of all of our needs through his glorious riches, it's through Christ Jesus. He's already taken care of all of our needs through Jesus Christ. And notice it says all of our needs, not all of our wants. And as I look around the auditorium right now, I'd say most of our needs are probably met. Thankfully, I am not preaching to a room full of naked people. Thank you, Jesus. We have clothes on our backs. Most in this room probably had breakfast this morning. If you didn't, it's because you didn't want to. And I know not only does God provide our needs, but he also uses people to provide our needs. And so I'll just go ahead and say boldly, if you are in fact in need of food, I guarantee you, you can get help before you leave here today. That the people in this room would be more than happy to help you to meet that need. But he is a God of provision. And I also want to read Matthew 6, 31 and 32. This is Jesus speaking. Because we get so wrapped up and we worry day to day. Jesus says, so don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. What a great reminder. Our Heavenly Father knows our needs. And God is not a liar. God is a promise keeper. And if you are a child of God, if you have a relationship with God through what His Son Jesus did on the cross for us, He knows your needs. And He will provide your needs. And so, write this down. When God guides, He always provides. When God guides, he always provides. The question is, is he guiding your life? Do you have that relationship with him? I believe this is a promise to his children. If he's the one guiding your life, he will always provide. And so I was thinking, where do I want to go in scripture? Where can we look for God's provision? And the answer is the entire Bible is full of examples of God's provision. So I said, well, maybe I should talk about the parting of the Red Sea and how God provide, provided that miraculous event so the Israelites could cross and get away from the, the Egyptians that were following. That was a pretty miraculous event. Or maybe how he provided manna from heaven or how the, the ravens dropped meat to feed the people. Or, or maybe his amazing time and provision when he sent a giant fish to sw at just the right time to swallow up a prophet and safely deliver him on dry land in Jonah. That's a pretty cool account. 
Or we go to the New Testament and pick any of the times that Jesus healed the people. That'd be kind of cool. He met a, a very felt need or, or his very first miracle at a wedding feast. He turned water into wine. That's a cool miracle. I could talk about that. Um, so many. How about a time where there was just a little boy with a bag lunch and with a bag lunch, Jesus multiplied it and fed over 5,000 people. 5,000 men alone, plus the women and children with leftovers. That's a pretty cool example of provision. And so I was praying about this, and, and it's like God said, well, what is the name given to me for provision? Jehovah Jireh. Okay. Is there a time in the Bible that I'm called Jehovah Jireh? Yeah. Well, why don't you teach on that? Okay. And so today, if you brought your Bibles, I encourage you to go to the very first book in the Bible, Genesis. We're going to be in chapter 22. Genesis is an easy book. If you have a hard time finding the first book of the Bible, you might have slid a little bit farther than you thought. <laughs> if you don't have a Bible, it'll be on the Sky Bible behind me. You can follow along there. And Genesis chapter 22 is where we're going to camp out. And this is the thing I love. It really doesn't matter where you decide you're going to teach from. Genesis to Revelation, it all has one thing. And the entire Bible points to Jesus. The entire Bible points to Jesus. And so, starting in verse 1, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. It says, sometime later. Just to give a little context, Abraham, if you're not familiar with who he is, Abraham was promised by God that he was going to have a child. And through this child, the nations of the world would be blessed. This son that he had was named Isaac. Isaac means he laughs. And the reason they named him Isaac, he laughs, is because it was comical to Abraham and his wife, Sarah, when God came to them and said, through you, I'm going to give a child and through that child and his seed, the nations of the world will be blessed. Because when God came to them, they were already old. They were really, really old. And so Sarah was laughing. And God said, why, why are you laughing? She said, I'm old and barren. I can't have kids. Well, God's a promise keeper. And so through a miraculous miracle of God, God, in fact, allowed Sarah to become pregnant. They had their son, Isaac. And now we fast forward to this moment where God is calling Abraham to do something. He said, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much. Can you imagine for just a second how much Abraham loved Isaac? I've been blessed with two daughters. I got Hannah, who's a sophomore in high school. I've got Denise, who's a freshman in college, which is crazy and hard to believe. I love them so much. God says, this is your only son that you never thought you would have. Imagine the love that Abraham had for Isaac. He said, and go to the land of Moriah, go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. What? Can I tell you, I used to not like even reading this chapter. I didn't like it. I'm like, why would he even ask that? I don't even want to think about that. I mean, that's completely out of order. I can tell you that one of my greatest fears of my life would be to stand up one day and do the funeral of one of my girls. It is one of my greatest fears much less be the one responsible for it. And you promised, God promised Abraham this son and now he's asking him to go sacrifice. I didn't like this chapter in the Bible. I would just kind of skip over it. I'm like, it makes no sense to me when I didn't fully understand what was going on. He said, take him to the mountains, which I will show you. But watch what Abraham does. The next morning, Abraham got up early. Yeah, forget that. But he got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire 
for a burnt offering, and he set out for the place that God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told his servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. We will worship. Worship is just submitting to the will of God, trusting in who he is. And then Abraham makes the statement, we will be right back. So Abraham, watch this, he placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, which by the way, I think most theologians believe Isaac was somewhere between 15 and 30 years old. I know growing up on a little felt board, Isaac was a little kid, but he was old enough and strong enough and big enough to carry his own wood. Abraham put the wood on Isaac's back. He put it on his shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? I love that. I mean, you got to have fun when you read the Bible, by the way. I love reading scripture and asking for it to just come alive. And when I read that, it makes me laugh because I can just picture it in my mind. You know, they're walking along. They're on a three-day journey. It's his son and his dad, right? They're just camping out, sitting around the campfire, eating s'mores at night, telling stories, probably having a great time together. And then it's just the two of them. They're walking up and Isaac, you know, he's sitting there doing his checklist. He's like, wood, check. Fire, check. Knife, check. Hey, Dad, I think we're missing something, buddy. Where's the lamb? Where is the lamb? Isaac, he might not be a mathematician, but something is not adding up. Abraham answered, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. And they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. Can you imagine that moment? Can you imagine the tension? I mean, he said, God will provide. Now, Abraham is an amazing man of faith. The fact that he's saying God will provide... But Abraham is also looking back at other moments in his life when he once lost his wife, Sarah, when he almost lost the promised land because of stupid things that he had done. And both times God brought those back. Abraham knew God's promise that through this child, the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so he is saying with confidence, even if I kill my son, I believe God will bring him back. And guys, he didn't have the New Testament to see the resurrected Jesus. But he had this amazing faith. But I can't imagine that moment, raising the knife, the agony in him. Isaac's probably weeping. What in the world are you doing, dad? But he's laying there. Picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham was like, yes, here I am. Do not lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me, even your son, your only son. Were those the greatest words he's ever heard in his life? I guarantee it. He said, you haven't even withheld your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. This is a miraculous provision of God. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. He's getting ready to do the unthinkable. And at just the right time, God calls out and tells him to stop. Do not do that. And then through a miraculous provision provides a ram. And that is what we call substitutionary atonement. Something had to be sacrificed. And thankfully it was not Isaac. 
it was a ram. You see, Isaac had asked earlier, where's, where's the sheep, Dad? Where's the lamb? He wanted a lamb. God provided a ram. The lamb was coming and has in fact come. And he has come for us. And his name is Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate act of provision. That is the ultimate miraculous provision that God provided us. A personal relationship with a holy God through his son, Jesus Christ. I love 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God made Christ, that's Jesus, who never sinned. The sacrifice had to be perfect if it was going to be the once and for all sacrifice. Made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That is substitutionary atonement. I love that verse. I've already messed up today. I am a messed up person. And probably most of you have messed up in some way today. Either your thoughts or something you've said or something you've done. Jesus lived a perfect life. And he laid down his life on a cross for you and me. And it was on the cross that theologians, they call it the great exchange. He took all of our sin, all of our shame, the punishment for our sin, which is separation from God. He took it upon himself and he says, take my righteousness. And he made that exchange. That is the gospel. That is the good news. And I believe that the heart of the Christian message, there are really two questions. Who is Jesus? And what did he do on the cross? It's what separates Christianity from every other world religion. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Fully God. The eternal God. He left his perfect place in heaven and he came to this broken world. And it was on the cross that he made the exchange. It was on the cross. He took my sins and your sins upon himself. And he became that sacrifice. And he died on the cross. And they took his body and they put it in a tomb. And what we celebrate is on the third day is that Jesus didn't stay in the tomb. Jesus walked out of the tomb triumphantly, proving he is who he says he is, and he can do all he said he would do. And for anyone who believes in him and recognizes their need for a Savior, that we are not the Savior, but we are in need of a Savior. We are in need of a lamb. He says, I am the lamb. Call on me, and I will give you my righteousness. Friends, that is good news. That is the best news we could ever hear. And so I just want you to think about that when it comes to the provisions of our life, the needs in our life. If God was willing to do that, how much more will he provide our daily needs? Romans 8, 32 says, Since he, God, did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? If God loves us so much that he sent his son to this world to die for our sins, can't we trust that he'll take care of our day to day? And I know that's hard. But when I start struggling and when I start getting frustrated and the end of the month is coming and I'm like, the money's running out or the pressures of the world are coming, I just... Think about that promise. If he loves us so much that he was willing to give his son on a cross for us, don't you think, Tom, that he's going to take care of everything else? And the answer to that question is absolutely. Absolutely. Picking back up in verse 14, it says, he had already, he took the ram, sacrificed it. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yireh or Jehovah Jireh which means the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Abraham named that place. And I love this. This is Moses writing this. Moses is writing to the people. And he says, to this day, people still use that name as a proverb on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. I love that. When they referred to the mountain, they were, what's the name of that mountain? 
on this mountain the Lord will provide. Oh, wow. Where are y'all going camping? On this mountain the Lord will provide. And what they didn't know is they were prophesying. That's exactly what happened. Some 2,000 years later, you realize it's the exact same mountain range that Jesus laid down his life for us? On this mountain, the Lord will provide, and that's exactly what he did through Jesus. Jesus is the lamb that was promised. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, there, here he says it again, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. And I love that, by the way. It's like God's own trial. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you, you? Yeah, I swear by my own name. There is no one higher than God, no one for him to swear upon. He says, I swear by my own name that I will bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number, like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, foreshadowing Jesus Christ, all because you have obeyed me. Then they returned to the servants and traveled back to Beersheba, where Abraham continued to live. What an amazing account. What an amazing account of faith by Abraham. But you know what? I believe this is also an amazing account of faith where God is revealing himself to Isaac. Because it was, Abraham knew he eventually was going to pass. He was going to be gone. And eventually that faith, was his son Isaac going to have it? And was Isaac going to be strong in that faith? I guarantee he's strong in that faith after seeing this miraculous provision. But then one day Isaac's going to pass away. But Isaac had a son and his name was Jacob. And then one day Jacob was going to pass away. But Jacob had a son and his name was Joseph. And then Joseph was going to pass away. But what about Joseph's kids and their kids and their kids until eventually we get to Jesus? You see, our faith is not just about us. Are you passing that faith on to your children? When God miraculously provides for you, do you keep that to yourself or do you say, look at what God did. Kids, come here. You're not going to believe this. I want for my girls to know Jehovah Jireh just like me and Leah know him. I want them to feel it. I want them to trust him with all of their lives. Because one day we're going to be gone. And then one day they're going to have kids. And I want them to be pouring into their kids just like we're trying to with them. I want to be a family whose descendants are just like the descendants of Abraham and Isaac. To be strong in their faith. And this passage used to freak me out. It doesn't freak me out anymore. I love this passage because the entire chapter of Genesis 22, all it is is a foreshadow of Jesus. That's all it is. It's an actual account that happened, but it's a foreshadowing of Jesus. And so I just want to take, just want to wrap it up. And I just want to show you some themes from this passage that point to our substitutionary atonement. The things that happened in Isaac's life that were fulfilled in Jesus' life. First of all, both Isaac and Jesus were born in accordance to promises given years in advance. And they were both born at the appointed time. God spoke to Abraham and Sarah and said, you will have a son. They laughed. They did have that son. Some 25 years later, they named him Isaac. He laughs. Well, Jesus is in the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis. In fact, the first gospel is in Genesis chapter 3. It's in, or Genesis chapter 2. It's on the third page of my Bible. Talking about what Jesus will do for us. And so we're promised all the way from the beginning, the coming of the Lamb. Both were, both of their births were promised. And both were born at just the appointed time. Both sons, Isaac and Jesus, were born miraculous births. We've already talked about that. Sarah was old. It says that she was 90 years old, in her 90s, when she gave birth to Isaac. 
90-year-old women do not have kids. Sarah was barren. She said, I could never have kids. Abraham was over 100 when they had Isaac. Jesus was born, married, 14-year-old virgin. Both of these women's, their pregnancy was a miracle of God. A miracle of God. Both sons were loved by their father. Multiple times in this passage of Scripture, Abraham or God is talking to Abraham and he says, Your son, whom you love. Your only son, whom you love so much. We know that God loved Jesus. When Jesus came out of the water after being baptized, he came out of the water and the voice from heaven said, Behold, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Both Isaac and Jesus went from idyllic places of rest to horrific places of sacrifice. Isaac was born in a wealthy family. Abraham was extremely wealthy. He was raised in a place called Beersheba. He left that idyllic place of rest in Beersheba and traveled that journey to the mountain of Moriah for sacrifice. Jesus left his eternal glorious place in heaven and traveled in journey to a cross. Both went from an idyllic place of rest to a brutal sacrifice. Both men went on a three-day journey. Isaac went from his place in Beersheba to Moriah. Jesus went on a three-day journey from the cross to the empty tomb. Both went on a three-day journey. Both were escorted by two men. Isaac was escorted by two servants. Jesus was escorted to a place of sacrifice by two thieves on either side of him. Both men, both young men, carried their own wood on their backs. Abraham placed the wood on Isaac's back. Isaac carried his own wood to the place of sacrifice, just like Jesus one day after brutally being beaten, where they whipped him with a cat of nine tails, ripped the flesh off his back. It is brutal. People don't want to talk about that. But he did that for you and he did that for me. And after just bones and skin exposed, they took a shredded cross and they put the wood on Jesus' back. And Jesus carried the cross on his own back for you and me to the place of sacrifice. Both of these young men willingly submitted to the will of their father. Isaac, big enough, strong enough to carry his own wood. Most people, 15 to 30 years old. That would have made Abraham 115 to 130. If you're 115 or 130, you would not be able to restrain a teenager or a young man unless he allowed it. And even if he thought you could restrain him, I think we could all agree he could probably outrun you. Isaac willingly crawled up on that altar for his father, just like Jesus willingly laid down his life for us. Jesus said, no man takes my life. I willingly sacrifice it. Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done, Father. Both men asked questions to their father at that time. Isaac said, Dad, where's the lamb? We know that Jesus is that lamb. When his cousin John the Baptist was in the river, he looked up and said, Behold, the lamb of God who will take away the sins of this world. Jesus, while on the cross, said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That question gives me goosebumps because, friends, it is that moment right there when Jesus cried out to God the Father, Why have you forsaken me? That was the very first time in all of eternity that he had been separated from God the Father. Their eternal God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, eternal. And for the very first time, God turned his back on Jesus so that he would never have to turn his back on us. 
It was in that moment when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That he was paying the penalty for our sins. Hebrews tells us that Isaac was raised from the dead figuratively. We know that Jesus was raised from the dead literally on the third day, walked out of the grave, and for 40 days was witnessed by over 500 people. People who many gave their lives because they had seen it with their own eyes. And then both, this is one of my favorite parts, both, after their one figurative and one literal resurrection, went on to get their bride. The next time we're introduced to Isaac after this, you fast forward, if you keep reading a couple of chapters, you see that Isaac was given his bride, Rebecca. Well, we know, we're told, that Jesus, when he came out of the tomb, he came to get his bride. Ephesians 5 tells us that Jesus is the groom, and his bride is who? The church. It's us. Jesus came to get his bride. And I was talking to my wife, Leah, about that and the circumstances behind that, about, you know, Isaac didn't literally go and get his bride. His father, Abraham, sent a servant to go get Rebecca and bring her back. He sent someone to get Isaac's bride. Jesus is sending you and me to continue to build his church. His last words to us, the Great Commission, go therefore into all the world, baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do the things that I command. It is you and I that are responsible. He left us with such an amazing responsibility to build his church, his bride, his bride. And so what I want you to think about as you leave here today, what I want you to be challenged with as you leave here today, it's a crazy reality, but that you might be a part of God's miracle plan. Have you ever considered that? that you might be a part of God's miracle plan as well? That you and I are called to build the church? To point people to Jesus? All we can do is point people to Jesus. He's the one that will draw them to himself. But you and I are called to point people, as many people, to Jesus. And we, in doing that, get to be a part of his miracle plan. So whatever you're going through today, wherever your life circumstances are, I want you to know that the God who provided his son that loves you that much will take care of your $1,387.96 circumstance, whatever that is. And I know you have one. We all do. But if we can trust him with our eternity, if we can trust him with our salvation, let's trust him in everything. Heavenly Father, that is our prayer, that we, in fact, learn to trust you with all of our lives. Not some of our lives, all of our lives. God, that if there's somebody in this room today, that means trusting in you for the very first time. God, I pray that today is that day that today they recognize who you are and what you've done, that you love them so much that you went to a cross for them. And Jesus, in their own words, they will just recognize right now that you are who you say you are, that you can do all that you said you would do, and that includes forgiving them of their sins. God, I pray that they will ask for forgiveness, that you will come into their life right now, Fill them with the Holy Spirit, change them from the inside out, and make them who you want them to be. God, I pray for every single person in this room that's been walking with you for years, maybe, that we will leave this place today remembering who you are, remembering the most miraculous provision you've ever given us, and that is Jesus Christ, and that it will change the way we live our lives. And that we will realize that we too get to be a part of your miraculous plan. God, I pray that you will use the people of the lake to flip this community on its head for Jesus Christ. We love you and we praise you. 
And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen.